Welcome to the SOS Mastermind Group Workshop. Today is April the 21st, 2022, and our topic for today is to stop project leakage or avoid the Bermuda Triangle. I'm Charles Wiles. I'm with the SOS Business Strategies Group. Uh, I've got over 40 years of experience working with oil and gas projects and other types of projects around the world. And today I work uh, helping companies with uh, business strategies to optimize their profit and performance. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, an affiliate of mine. Duncan, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, Duncan Oifar, we create business of your teams. And uh, we, what we mean by that is that people uh, or employees and engineers, especially, they, um, they, they speak the language of the business. Engineers are very good at engineering. But the business side is sometimes a little bit lacking. Um, I worked for 10 years with an engineering company, traveled around the world, 10 years with an energy company, um, went through all stages of, uh, of the business and started in 2011 with uh, creating business savvy teams. Charles? For those uh, that are might be participating or want to participate in the future, a mastermind group is a... Uh, is a is a peer group, is a consulting peer group of presidents and business leaders that are interested in uh, confronting their challenges, learning new opportunities. And these groups that we establish usually are eight to 14 people uh, from various industries and backgrounds, but they're facing similar business challenges across the board. And so although the, uh, the benefits for a, uh, for a membership are uh, for our quality and define the other benefits, we help uh, individuals and business leaders and project managers increase accountability, uh, put people together with similar backgrounds and bounce ideas off of them. We provide a, a strong network support through that, access professionals and, and complementary strengths and presentations. We improve delegation skills. We increase profitability. We help them with business coaching input and improve the level of business expertise. If you're interested in joining one of our mastermind groups, please do so, just contact me. Today's mission is to address how to improve project performance and attract and retain valued resources and improve financials. Duncan? Yeah, our path is um, <clears throat> to um to show you that, uh, and I will come back to that in later in my presentation, that uh, the profits margins in general with engineering service companies is very low. Um, and they're, they're, they're below 5%. And there is an opportunity to get uh, even more to 15%. So a lot of engineering companies uh, lose about 10% of margin during the project execution. And in my presentation, I will tell you what the cause of that is and how to avoid that and how to escape from there. So, Charles. Thank you, Duncan. What is a project? It's an interesting question because project is defined as a sequence of tasks that must be completed to attain a certain outcome. But the thing is, is no matter how you look at your business, Every business is made up of projects, from the accounting department to the bookkeeping department to the engineering department and so forth. They're all projects that we have a beginning identification and we have an end target and we execute a process through that. The real question is, so why do some projects succeed? And what Duncan is going to go through, he's going to go through some of the areas that he's learned in interfacing with uh, some of his clients as to areas that we can improve that. But if we take a look at it, projects succeed because of two factors. They're the right project and because they are done right. And I'm sure Rajan and some of the others can realize that, you know, what is the right project? If you, if you contract yourself out to the wrong project, you're going to fumble through it and you're not going to succeed. But in, in all cases, no matter how you approach it, it's got to be done right. And if you can find a way to get these two conditions in place, you're on the path to successful delivery. But Charles, can, do you mind if I, can I interrupt you or should I wait? Please the do. Uh, 
I mean, defining the right project, I mean, as a consultant, sometimes you're approached by a client to work on a project or run a project, which in your opinion may not be right because sometimes the definition is not clear. The client does not know exactly what they want. And sometimes you have to help the client streamline those issues, bring clarity to the project, what is needed, develop the scope for them. And then in kind of way, like you said, it becomes the right project. But just when the client approaches us, whether the project is right or wrong or incorrect, I don't turn it down. Am I doing something wrong? I don't think you're necessarily doing something wrong because it's the, uh, the starting point of any project is the definition of what's to be done. And in most cases, sure. when, they, when you're invited in as a consultant to start helping them formulate that definition, right, right. without a definition and without a target, you know, it's kind of like when we were in the engineering business for oil and gas. Right. If there was an opportunity to build bridge crossovers or roadways, that would be the wrong project for the wrong, for the wrong group. Right. So it's got to be something that has an expertise as a consultant you. or otherwise, that you have to bring something to the party that's going to add value. Different. Got you. Got you what you said. Okay. Good question. So the question is, if we're going to have a successful project, where do we start? I'm going to change over and let, uh, <clears throat> let Duncan take charge of uh, sharing the screen here. Okay. Here we go. <clears throat> Are you on the screen? Can you yeah. see that, Rick? Yes. Okay. yes, I can see that. So what I would like to talk about is about uh, margin leakage in, uh, in projects. Um, that's my experience, what we have. And um, <clears throat> I want to show you what we figured out, what we uh, studied, what we investigated, and also how to avoid it. So let me go to the next uh, slide. And, <clears throat> you know, they just what is the similarity between the Bermuda Triangle and engineering projects? Rajan, do you have any idea about that? I know, but the Bermuda Triangle is probably can relate. Uh, like Charles said, this is not the right project, or you you're gonna sink in there if you don't handle it right. Or <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're close, you're close, right? You know, it it, it both uh, <laughs> it, it has a, a, a triangle. The engineering project has a triangle, and the Bermuda uh, triangle is a triangle. The other thing is that things disappear; they vanish in it. Uh, for the Bermuda Triangle, uh, ships and planes uh, disappear in it. For projects, <clears throat> it's uh, the margins that disappear. You know, we have a contract margin, we have an expected margin during the project, but also at the end, we have a realized margin. And that's where, that's where it goes wrong. Let me explain it to you. you know, on the left side, you see that we uh, start with a project. And when you are an engineering company, for instance, for Shell or for the big uh, whatever clients, you have a contract. And in average, there's a margin of 12.5% on that. That's how you start with your project. During the execution of the project, a lot of projects lose a lot of margin. And there are a lot of circumstances. Of course, there are external circumstances from the client or regulations or other things that play, but there's also a lot of leakage of margin within your project. And that's such a shame and that's such a pity. <clears throat> now, if you look at that, if you start with 12.5%, at the end, you come out around 3.8%. So you lose about 9% of leakage on your margin. That's huge. And what we figured out after talking to about 500 engineers, 30 teams, 25 leaders and four continents, is that the causes of that is that people, the engineers are too busy with the technical part instead of discussing the business or the commercial part. Cool, cool. You know, they're not talking, okay, how many hours did we spend? How much do we still have to go? What is the progress? Did we send out the invoices on time? What are the penalties? What are the opportunities? All these kind of stuff is not discussed during the team, and there's no 
progress on that also. Other points, and there's just a, a few of them because the list is endless, so to say, uh, scope of contract, not specific. You know, oh yeah, we'll do it like this or we do it like that. Ah, scope creep, additional work. It's not calculated through to the client or invoice to the client. And you cannot invoice it at the end of the project, but the client will say, I don't know, I don't know what happened. Uh, the budget is closed, I'm sorry. Um, there's not a sufficient risk analysis or even better opportunity assessment done. Incomplete post calculations, parts are missing, relocation of people, computer, IT, whatever you wanna, so it's not calculated. Um, what we see and what, what my experience was in, in the early days that we always brought in <clears throat> during the, the contract and the proposal phase to the, 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 the project manager who's going to execute the project. So that, avo that avoids that you lose a lot of information in transition from sales to execution. Uh, another thing, billing and payment conditions. You know, you only have to change the sentence in the contract and it has a huge impact on your financials of your project. Yeah, a lot of projects are with a negative cash flow. An engineering company is not a bank. So make sure that your cash flow is positive on a project. Slow and incomplete billing process. How many times does it happen that they are only, only billing at the end of the month instead of any time it's possible or allowed by the contract? It has such a huge impact on your cash flow and on your profit uh, eventually. And then the, the, the most difficult part maybe, and well, I think I can say because I'm an engineer myself, it's sometimes difficult to discuss the commercial part of the work with the client. You know, go to the client, say, hey, client, that's not what you ordered. You have to pay for this. And every time we see when you are do it on a normal, acceptable way, the client will accept it. He says, I understand it. So these are a lot of just a, a selection of causes that, that will cause your, well, what will cause the Bermuda Triangle, so to say, of margin. <clears throat> margin, if you have any questions, feel free. Huh? So sure, go ahead. Sure, sure. So what, what happens in the end is that the margin of engineering service companies like the, and I'm, I'm just mentioning, and the, the, this is anonymous. So, you know, you, you have the, the, McDor the, the McDermott's or you have the Parsons or you have the Fleurs or the Warleys or the Jakes or whatever. You know, their margins fluctuate from 15% to, well, this is exceptional minus 33%. But on average, the, the EBIT, so the earnings before interest and taxes, is about around 4%. So if you have to pay interest and taxes, nothing is left over sometimes. You don't have the, 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 the money or the, the, the capital to invest in your people, to maintain your people, to retain your people, to educate them, to start differentiating. So it's really essential that we avoid this uh, Bermuda Triangle and stay away from it. So here we also show, you know, on, on the right side, it's, you're really in the red zone. And if you're going to the 15% exceptional, but we know companies and we are investigating this already for the th three, four years, every time they're above the 10%. So it is possible. Marjan, is this clear for you, this, this overview? Yes, yes, definitely. Very good. Definitely. So <clears throat> let's go back to our margin Bermuda triangle. Is it only the 9% that we can recover? Is that the only part or is it more? Well, this is also what we found out. You can recover instead of the 9%, you can recover 11%. Because if you have the perfect situation or you work with business savvy engineers, you start a project and you know there's always additional work, there's always a scope change. There are always things that you can build to your clients. And you already made a cost, but now you're gonna build them more. So your margin will improve. And what we found out is the average of two and a half percent. That's what we get from our feedback from our company or from the, the people we questioned. So actually you can move from your 3.8% up to 15% of margin. And that makes it so interesting just to start creating this with business savvy engineers. Engineers that speak the language of business. And that just is how you can create a healthy business also. So because it will add to your top and bottom line, it will add more value to your clients because the engineers will talk with your client and say, hey, how's your business doing? How can I help you? I understand your business. 
I know how it works because I know how our business works. Maximum commercial engagement. So people will start asking, hey, how's the cash flow? How are we doing? What's the EBIT at this moment? What is the forecast? Where are we heading? How can we contribute to the higher goal of the organization? But it also is very important is enhancing the personal professional growth of the engineers and employees. You know, we have all been there. You know, there's a new program, a management program, and everybody is asking, what's in it for me? You know, and here we can say, you become a business savvy engineer. You can talk about the business. That will differentiate you from other engineers. That makes it so interesting. So creating awareness, creating business awareness. And what we mean by that is that as an engineer, you say, oh, this was a perfect project. It functions very well above expectations. The client is super happy. And then the organization start tapping on your shoulder, say, um, well, we didn't get the margin as, expect, as, as, as expected. And that's a bummer. You know, you would like to see a good project, a happy client, but also making money for your organization. And that's so interesting or that's so important. So that we go away from this Bermuda Triangle. So this is really also for the, the engineer that he understands what is the sweet spot. How can we serve the client well? How can we or the, serve the organization well? Because if the organization is doing well, the engineer will, have, be, will be happy. And a happy organization, a happy engineer makes a happy client. And this shows, you all, shows also that they are all tangled together. We're all sitting in the same boat. How we do it? This is our program. <clears throat> How to create business savvy engineers. Um, it's, it starts with an identification. It's a leadership workshop of one day. We'll go through the program. We start uh, calculating what is the potential in the next 12 months. How will it contribute to the higher goal of the organization? We have a, um, as an, an economic engagement scan developed together with the Harvard Business School. So that gives us an idea of the potential, what we can achieve. We also have the business savvy culture, uh, savvy uh, scan. So it's also how do you behave in a business savvy culture manner. Uh, after that, we have a two day team MBA with 15 to 20 engineers and they start, uh, we'll start together working with them and they will uh, uh, start to uh, determine what will be the first business challenge start as you see that's the next the second column so in the net for the next hundred days so for instance let's say they want to improve the cash flow so we say well we're now at 80 days of uh, cash flow you know DRO days receivable outstanding is 80 days we want to improve that by 10 percent for the next hundred days and the engineers will determine how they will do it so they will say we'll improve it by 10 percent they make their own scoreboard, very important. You know, there's a little bit of fun, creativity into that. And the engineers start and it's a team effort. So it's not a simulation, it's real on the, on the business. It can also be about being uh, determining what is our win rate with proposals? How can we improve our kickoff meetings? Uh, how can we improve uh, using invoice tools or cost tools? And we always calculate it back, what is the effect on the cash flow, on the EBIT, on the margin we're going to make. Um, and this is how we create the business savvy engineer. So after the first 100 days, that's why we call it start, they will present it to the management team. And what you will see is a totally different engineer, where they started at the beginning at day three, after the two day sessions, where they present their challenges to the management team. They're a little bit unsure about talking about the cash flow, you know, well, something cash flow, we're going to do this and that. After the 100 days, they will present it again, what they achieved. And they will say, this was the cash flow. This is what we did. This is it now. And this will, it will be in the next 100 days. Ownership, understanding what cash flow means. And it gives such a huge difference in how people start looking at the business. The second one, because you don't change people over a, over a night, so to say, uh, is the change of behavior. And there we see the acceleration in the challenges. We see the acceleration also in the, in the results, how they improve. 
We do that again. <clears throat> they make their own scoreboard. At the end of the 200 days, again, they present their results. We measure after each 100 days the business and SIFI culture scan, how their behavior changes. And at the end, we see sustain the, the last 100 days, and that's where they learn how to do it themselves, how to set up the challenge themselves for the next 100 days or after that, the next year, so to say. So it's also a continuous improvement program. So they look at certain issues, say, hey, we can improve that because it contributes to the cash flow, it contributes to the EBIT. This is how the mentality of the engineers changes. So they really get this business mind, this business language they're going to speak. Rajan, is this clear how it works or? Yes, yes. Yes? yes, yes. All right. And we, and we guide it with coaching. Every week we have a call with the team captains. We come by at certain moments. We, under, we support them with our uh, Business Savvy Academy. It's a digital tool. It's on the internet. They can put on the progress. We have discussions about it. And it's really in the business. So it's not a game or a challenge, a simulation game. Uh, it's really, we talk about the business results. Right. It also makes it that this program is self-funding. So the results you achieve, the costs are paid for the program. So what is, just to give you some examples in the value stream of an engineering company, you have marketing and sales, you have requests for proposal, you have the execution and the delivery. I know there are many steps more, but this is on a high level, just to make it simple. Well, for marketing and sales, and a challenge could be determine the niche market or what is the client? Who are, who are favorite clients to work for? What the kind of products do we have? What kind of differentiating products do we have? For the request for proposal, improve our win rate, optimize the process of making uh, proposals, make sure that we have a positive cash flow in the proposals. Should we start with a proposal team? Identify the risk and the opportunities. Well, execution, next phase. We have a clear uh, kickoff. What is the project? What is the delivery? What are the milestones? What is the, the payment schedule? What is the penalties, et cetera? All these kinds of things. Do we have regular progress meetings? Do we talk about the business instead of only the technical solutions? Improve invoicing. Not at the end of the month, any moment within the month, we can send out an invoice. And the delivery, first time right, on time, quality, after sales. But also there, the list is very long. You know, there are a lot of opportunities, but it's up to the team how to, to they, they, they decide what they want to start with. And it always should be in line with the 12 month goal they want to achieve. So if you want to sell apples at the end of the 12 months, don't start with bananas, you know, that kind of things. Um, make sure that they understand the longer picture and how they can contribute to that. This is an example of how it could look like a program like this. This is just working with one team for 15 to 20 people. Start with the cash flow improvement. <clears throat> so, you know, just focus on that and continue with that. In the second uh, part, the next 100 days, scope creep, utilization, improvement challenges. Third one, sales improvement challenges. This is how you can build it up. Because you have to make a selection of, okay, we're only going to focus on this. You cannot do everything at once. So what is the highest priority? Well, I think cash flow is still the highest priority. You know, cash is king. You can have a negative EBIT, but uh, it won't kill you. You have a very bad cash position, it will kill you. Um, these are the parts, and, and it's, it's just an example, but it's up to the teams. They decide what do we need first. <coughs> how this, how it's going to contribute to the higher goal as soon as possible. Rajan, do you want to ask something or... No, 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 I'm listening. It's an it's interesting topic. I mean, it's not just, sometimes I felt as a consultant coming in an organization and uh, working with their team mm. that it's not just the engineers or the project team. Sometimes even the senior folks or the management folks lack those skills also. Exactly. And, and if you try to bring your opinion as a consultant, you try to educate then you are a troublemaker and, uh, <laughs> and uh, you may not be accepted. Yeah, but I as know. As a consultant, our job is to do the things right and in the right way. And to listen. 
I mean, you're talking about resources uh, which are business savvy. A lot of times you get resources, forget about being business, having the business acumen. They're not really technically fit for that project. So no. they have wrong people on the right project. Yep. And uh, don't have a choice. True. True. So, I mean, I can see a lot of reasons for the leakage, which you're just talking about. Uh, one of the examples, important ones you just touched base was that the scope is not very well defined. And uh, you get the CTRs developed where you can exactly define what we're going to achieve in that phase of work mm. and what the deliverables will be. Some folks will define it accurately and some are just weak terminology. So the client expects a lot more work, but their definitions are not clear and you end up burning more hours. I mean, there are a ton of ways those leakages which you're talking about, project leakages, happen all the time. Exactly. And, exactly. and to my experience, it's not just the... Uh, team is, is even the senior management people a lot of times uh, like you talked about the processes the processes are there as a guideline but a lot of times you have to use your own judgment exactly. business acumen and bend around those processes not just fo follow them blindly exactly exactly I mean, we see this day in and day out uh and the answer is, a lot of times, we have been doing this for 20, 25 years. Mm. Yeah, you have been doing it for 25 years in the incorrect way. You can improve the cost, you mean profits and all, but it's difficult. It, it, it is difficult. And, and, and I think what you also see is that a good engineer becomes a manager. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and then the engineer has to talk about uh, personal development plans and that sort of things which he doesn't want to do. I was a young engineer that time, uh, one time, I mean, a long time ago, this is an example I'll give you. You were just talking about overdoing, trying to be a perfectionist. Hmm. And a simple thing like a pad eye, there was a guy who was doing it, he had a PhD and very decorated engineer. He hmm. spent a month on a pad eye, optimizing it. Yeah. So those are the kind of things where you want to be more conservative, extra margins, and let it go. In two hours, you can crank it out. You spend one month on it. So yeah. forget about 9% market uh, project leakage you have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the, you're, you're totally correct. You know, what we also see is, is high-paid uh, PhD uh, engineering guys uh, and, and ladies also uh, working on a Word document you know, and, and changing the font and that sort of things. Come on, you got somebody else to do that. You know, you have to focus on the client and look at the bigger picture because that's where you're paid right. for. Right. And, and, and not for changing the color of, of, of a graph or something like that. You know, there's, there are other people probably within the company who love to do that, right. you know? And, 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 and that's also, sorry, go ahead. And one thing also, these contracts which we write it out, they need to be the right type of contract for the right phase of the project. Mm. You definitely don't want to like a lump sum type contract in a pre-feed or a feed stage. Exactly. Where things are constantly changing. You want where to you need a lot of dialogue with your client. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. So there are a lot of issues. We all have experienced it and uh, it's a good effort. I appreciate Yeah, no, and, and, and we yeah. still do the same thing, you know, we still make the same mistakes. Right. <laughs> excellent, excellent all right let's see well what, what can we achieve um this is a selection of what we have achieved and you know an engineering company started with an ebit of the q1 of minus 11 uh it ended with a plus 10 just by being becoming more business savvy and we're also, we're not focusing on doing things less. So we're not saying you shouldn't do this. No, we're, we're saying, what can we do to improve also for the client and for the business? And then automatically people start stopping things that don't add value. 
you know, so we keep it on the, in a positive, you know, we call it in, uh, appreciative inquiry, what we use and ask about the positive things and not say, well, you shouldn't do this or you shouldn't do it. No, they will figure it out. They know much better. Utilization or billable hours with 8% increase. Well, that's huge for, for small engineering companies. Um, payment, yeah, days receivable, outstanding. Reduction by 50%. And, and that, that's one of my favorite because it was about the cookie jar. You know, what they did is they made uh, a baking plate with cookies and they, put, had, they bought plastic cookies and they put the project number on it. And every, cook, every invoice that was, that was sent out for this project, the, the cookie would go from the baking plate into the cookie jar. So that was nice. And nobody wanted to have this project on the baking plate because they want to have the cookie in the, in the cookie, cookie jar. And then the second month, the, the, the team decided, well, we're going to bake real cookies. So when you were on time, you got a fresh cookie. When you were too late, you got an old cookie. You know, so that was also the fun behind it. So that made it also a lot of fun and laugh and, and, and people start laughing. So that really quickly improved uh, the DRO. The last one, win rate, proposal win rate. You know, it's always when we ask the engineers. So, you know, first of all, well, what's win rate? They ask, they look at you, win rate? Soccer? Is it about football? Is it all about other things? No, about the proposals. You send out 100 proposals. How many proposals will be a contract? And they say, oh, 25, 30. You know, they're proud about it. And they say, okay, so 25, 30%. So the costs of the 75% to 60% has to be recovered in those 25 to 30%. And then you see the changes. You know, the, you see their faces change. And then like, oh, that's not so good. No. You know, and, and then they start thinking about it. And then they start looking into <clears throat> uh, who are, which, 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 with, uh, uh, which clients are we successful? Then they make a list. Boom. Okay, good. So, and where do you make the most uh, revenue? Boom, another list. And where do you make the most profit? Another list. And then we get the question, okay, and who's your favorite client? And you want, what do you mean? Well, here's the list. Now, what does your gut feeling say? Is it the client you want to work for and you make a lot of money or less money? That is also something you have to think about it because at the end, we're, with this knowledge, we start to have bit no bit meetings. Are we going to be successful with this client? Are we going to build a relationship with this client? All these kind of things. And that's also, you know, it, so it, it, it already starts, yeah, what I just showed you here, it starts already with marketing and sales. Because we have also seen a lot of organizations that are, well, they look like proposal machines, pushing out proposals, 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 and everybody is working their body off. And the utilization is low, but they're working proposals, proposals, proposals. Stop with it. Stop it. And when you start there at the beginning, you see a, 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 some sort of, you know, rest and, and, and calmness going through the organization because they get more in control. They think about the things. Are we going to bid on this client? Yes or no? Okay, how are we going to bid on it? You know, and you see they may still spend a lot of time on a proposal, but the quality of the proposal is much higher. A much higher proposal, much higher hit rate. And that works through the whole failure stream. Good. Well, just to show you here uh, some happy teams. We do it uh, from Berlin to Riyadh, Hong Kong, Houston, the Netherlands. Um, and we really see that people are really happy when we are there. They really start understanding how the business works and, and how it creates more self-esteem, uh, not being afraid to call a client, um, go to a client, even ask the simple question for a client from, how is your business going? You know, before they started with this, they were thinking about, uh, I, I need to know everything about this business. No, you just ask, how is the business going? And every client is proud to tell about his own business. So let's get business savvy. You can download our full report on uh, businesssavvyengineer.com. And uh, I'll hand it over to Charles. Thank you, Duncan. Let's see if we can't in ca capture uh, 
what uh, what we've covered here. And one of the areas we didn't cover, Rajan, was really about the uh, the organization and the foundations and fundamentals of the of the overall organization. But if you go back to uh, to what makes a successful project, oops. Don't know what happened there. Did I lose you? No, we're still here. We're still here. We're just getting that open Zoom meetings page, Zoom page. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm looking for the slideshow. Here we go. Yep. When we started the uh, the discussion, we, uh, we 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 defined what a successful project could do, and we said it had to be the right project. And the, the example that we talked about was you don't want a process engineering company doing a road work or a bridge work or something like that, but it's got to be something that works, something that can be defined, and something that can be followed. And so when we look at the the fundamentals of what is the core business of the business itself. Is it in, in the business of A, B, or C? But it's got to be the right project in line with the right business. It must have the appropriate mission critical resources to achieve the success. The teams, the organization, the structure and the like. And it must also have alignment internally with those aspects. But coming back to, uh, to what Duncan was talking about, you know, it's got to be done right, you know, the performance definition, it's got to be clear and concise and everybody has to be on board. Knowing the challenges and how do we overcome the challenges and identifying those challenges are important keys to, uh, to keeping the momentum going in, as far as improving performance. We must also be aware that there, we have to have changes in behaviors and attitudes uh, because if, because the way people work, if they've got the wrong attitude and they're not happy where they are, are they going to be productive? The answer is no. So with Duncan's process, he's able to address these issues on a continuing basis and he can, he can bring it in. And also, you've got the aspect of continuous improvement, focused on what needs to be changed in order to get you to the next phase. Duncan, is there anything you want to add to that? No, no, it's uh, it's... 100%. So, thank well, John, you. I heard you. You asked a question earlier. You know, you're just a consultant, but then how does a consultant contribute to the overall success of a project? And if you, you know, Duncan's gone through some things here that, uh, that could put you in a position to, to be influential in introducing new concepts and new strategies to your clients and understanding that if you work with the performing the project correctly and doing it right, it doesn't hurt and it doesn't cost you anything to take a look and see what's underneath the kimono. Well, what happens sometimes the ego comes in. <laughs> you coming in as a consultant, you have more experience and knowledge and that's the reason they hired you, right? But so the CEO of the company wants you, but the project team, the project manager, it's nervous. Mm. He does not want to accept his mistakes. So I had an experience where the project manager would not show up for one and a half. He would call 50 people to a meeting and would be late by an hour and a half. So mm. my simple answer was, why are you keeping 50 people over here? If you're late or running late, just text or somebody put an email that, hey, meeting. But the ego comes in, they feel threatened, whatever. Uh, there was a design, the same project manager had worked on or led an effort 15, 20 years ago. And that was the state of the art technology at that time. But now technologies have advanced and I'm on that project and he wanted to copy the same style of work and uh, same technology. So I kind of suggested, hey, these are the advancements done. If you don't do it this way, you're gonna see these, these, these problems. Uh, and actually 
that was the problems in the past projects because they were doing a lot of studies, what caused it and all that stuff, but they don't want to change. And change mm. is a little bit different, difficult aspect. I'm not saying that's the culture everywhere, but different organizations may have different challenges. So in this particular case, like I was saying, it was the management and uh, they get threatened or egos come in. They are very reluctant to change or improve the processes. Whereas as a consultant, when you come in, you, the top management expectation is, that's the reason we brought you in here and your ideas and uh, knowledge needs to be applied here where the team does not want to accept it. Mm. So every project sometimes is technically challenging, sometimes it's people, soft skills challenges. <laughs> you see different, different type of challenges. Uh, it would be nice if everybody had an open mind and we could uh, brainstorm on solutions and pick up the best uh, but that does not always happen very smoothly. So can you uh, got a recommendation for him for him to uh, to, to push forward? Yeah, <clears throat> uh, I'm I'm not fully aware of, of the of the situation, but I, I recognize it. You know, it, we call it also seagull management. You know, management comes in, shit <laughs> on the table, and fly away. Uh, <clears throat> it's always it's always difficult, and when you're a consultant, you're even in a in a, in a worse worser condition. So to say, um, but it's it's just keep asking questions. That's the best thing. That's that, that's a great suggestion. Uh, as long as you can keep your uh, your your questions to the management of the team or the leaders in an open form. You know, yeah, right. what do you think will happen if we go that route? Where will we go? Where will we end up if we went this route? If you ask yeah. open-ended questions you can sometimes walk them through the psychology of creating a, a path that you would agree with and they could agree with by having them give you feedback in the process. I think that's a great recommendation, Duncan. Thank you. Sure, sure, definitely. I mean, you, you need a collaborative environment where you listen to the other person, you bring your own ideas and but, but you have to be patient sometimes, you know. Correct. Sometimes, Correct. sometimes you're boiling, you know, you know, already know the answer. <laughs> well, you have to be patient, but at the same time, you have a project schedule. Yeah. Like you just talked about project cost, budget, schedule. So, and you want to have a good quality of the project also. So, you don't have the luxury of time all the time either. True. How long to be patient also. True. Uh, so there are a lot of factors come in, and and if it was that simple, we we would not be needed, right? <laughs> no, that's true. And 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 just to to add to my story, um, we're not working for all engineering companies. It it works only with the engineering companies. They understand that they the the knowledge and the business and the profit is made by the by the by the by the engineers. Correct. Right. You know, so we already work with companies that say. I love my people and I want to make the best with them, you know, and, and, and that sort of thing. And not the, uh, the, the, the alpha top alpha guy, uh, you know, oh, I know everything and that sort of thing. It won't work. It won't work. So it, we already have a separation for the companies that contact us and we work with them and the companies we don't work with. So. Right. 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 Yeah. right. What do you think, Rajan? Was this value-added time spent? Definitely, definitely, definitely. Is there anybody that you know could benefit from this type of information? My personal thought would be there are, I mean, you want to go to like the big companies and uh, there are, uh, in fact, I have uh, attended quite a few uh, these kind of uh, sessions, but they were like a week long at a time. Mm. And uh, this kind of approach of educating the team and all can be done different ways, maybe like in a team building type case or in just in general, a select group of uh, folks uh, selected by the company, like 15, 20 people number you gave. 
and try to improve the overall processes in the company, the culture, the attitudes, uh, bringing this, not just the technical skills, but having the business acumen, understanding the business side of things mm. to make the company more profitable. It, it is definitely a great uh, thing to do. And uh, I think definitely companies will benefit, but uh, I would say probably those with bigger teams mm. because smaller teams are a little bit easier to manage is the mess starts when you have a little bit bigger companies, uh, bigger teams, and uh, the coordination or the collaboration part mm -hmm. is missing. The communication is not effective. Uh, True. Yep. A but lot we, of bigger organizations uh, can definitely benefit out of that. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, we, we also work with small companies. We're working now with 15 to 20 people on a small organization. Um, and, and, and it starts with forecasting, for instance, uh, the billable hours, what is your average man hour rate, uh, really the basics of the basics, you know, and now they're in the third game or challenge. And, uh, now we are focusing on, on making, uh, clients, uh, uh, communication and, and building client teams, so to say, improve the client relationship. And if we would have started that at the beginning, they wouldn't have a clue. They wouldn't understand. So it's already also step by step that they really understand, okay, what's the next step? And, and what we see a lot is that the engineers say, okay, this is what we're doing now in this challenge, but uh, we have a lot of ideas and we park that for the next challenge. Right, right. You know, they kind of, so, he kind of engrave it in the company culture when they're small on these aspects. Huh? Yeah, 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 yeah. So... Rajan, I'd like to thank you for your time. Thank you, you and, and uh, Dr. Both. Please, yeah. uh, please feel free to, uh, to to pass on the good word and sure, let me know sure. if you know some uh, organizations or some leaders that might be interested in this, and I'll bring Duncan back again. Sure, definitely. definitely. Do you need some uh, information, Rajan? Can we send you something? Sure, if you feel like. Uh, sure. I think Charles has my email. Or okay. if not, I can put it in the chat, not an issue. Good. Okay. Then we'll send you uh, we'll send you the presentation or how you want to do that, uh, Charles. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll I'll organize the presentation so you can get a link to it. Good. And we can use it from there. All right. I just, Perfect. I just I just put my yeah. email address. I see it. Thank you. But I'll leave it up to Charles that he will send you the link, uh, Rajan. Nice to see you, Charles, again. Thank uh, you.